Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back to the BJJ Brick Podcast. This week we have episode 274. I'm Gary Hall. I'm here with my partners in crime, Joe Thomas, Byron Jabara. A lot of people call these guys the Ren and Stimpy of podcasting. <laughs> How are you guys? <laughs> oh, I'm pretty good. How about you, Gary? Uh, doing great. Yeah, I'm also doing good. I, I'm trying to think of a Ren and Stimpy quote, or I can't think of it other than, you idiot. But, uh, I think Ren would yell it at Stimpy. I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, we're doing great. Happy to bring this episode to you. We have Karen Atunez on the podcast this week as the interview. She's going to bring you a lot of good information. Uh, top competitor, coach, uh, somebody who's also has an off-the-mat life. Uh, really good to talk with her and uh, learn about her and her jiu-jitsu. So happy to bring you guys that interview this week. Gary, I'm a little surprised with the Ren and Stimpy reference. Was that – how old were you when that came out, you think? Probably 48. <laughs> <laughs> I used to love Ren and Stimpy. I don't know, you know, Ren and Stimpy, Beavis and Butthead. Those were uh, a couple of my favorite uh, shows. There you go. I'm pretty sure I was way too old to watch Ren and Stimpy myself and was already to a point where I don't think I wanted my kids to watch it. So I, I'm not really too familiar with Ren and Stimpy. It is good. It is good. You'll have to good. check it out. <laughs> I give it two thumbs up. Yeah. I bet if you watched yeah. it now, you would say, what was I watch? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> True. But one thing that doesn't change over the time is a timeless classic, like our audiobook, Six Trading Games for BJJ. Uh, Hold these... on, we got to stop right here. Yeah. Now, Byron, that was an incredible segue right there. <laughs> it goes it uninterrupted, is a timeless except for classic. one guy. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> timeless classic. Uh, what these trading games will do is they change your uh some of your parameters while you're rolling. And that what that does is really allows you to discover new things about your jujitsu. If the only thing you're trying to do while you train, and most of us do this, is you try to control and submit the other person. But if you change that a little bit, you'll really find your, your techniques still work the same, but if you have different goals or different options available to you, you'll find new ways to solve problems that used to give you trouble. And and you'll find new things about your own game that will really surprise you. And I think by doing this, I've learned a lot about my own jujitsu just through the time while I'm rolling, let alone the time where you learn jujitsu and you learn techniques, that sort of thing. So this is these games are designed to to do while you roll and give you some different directions to and things to work on. And it should kind of expand your jujitsu and, and really find new options for your own game. The book is a little bit over an hour long. It's five ninety nine. The money goes and helps support the show. I wrote produced and edited the book <laughs> even did the picture on the front cover uh so there you go it's uh and despite and despite all that we've still sold a couple of episodes because <laughs> <laughs> it's a timeless classic <laughs> there you go as in we've been selling it since it's been around <laughs> and when we do say classic we mean it's old like some yeah, of the games you might play <laughs> This takes us to our off-the-mat lesson. Uh, each week we have a lesson that we relate to jiu-jitsu. It, it can happen off the mat and we drag it onto the mat or vice versa. And here not too long ago I just had a physical and uh, everything went great. And uh, I really like my doctor. He's a doctor I switched to and, and I'll go back to the story why I switched to him. But he's a very proactive doctor. He, he talks to me about you know, exercise, supplementation, you know, how I'm eating, how I'm sleeping, which we talked about last episode, and, um, you know, just stuff like that. Um, but we'll go back to, uh, I was probably in my mid-40s, and I wasn't in there for a physical like I just was, but I had hurt my knee uh, at jiu-jitsu. So I went to the doctor, and I was having him look at my knee, and I figured I probably needed to, needed to look at, maybe get an MRI, who knows what I did to it, and... I can't just go in to get an MRI. I have to make an appointment to a doctor, and you know, the doctor has to look at it and you know, decide whether or not I need an MRI to see if there's any any anything crazy going on in there. So you know, doctor looks at it and you know does some tests and everything, and he's asking me how I did it. 
And I always hate bringing up jujitsu because a lot of times people don't know what jujitsu is and, you know, they'll start asking you about it or, you know, just look at you funny in, in some situations. Um, you know, I need to tell them my why and that'll set them straight. There you but, go. Yeah. But um, so I start talking about jujitsu and he was a little familiar with jujitsu and, you know, he's like, yeah, I've seen that on, on TV and everything. So I think he just assumed it was MMA. But then, uh, you know, he starts talking to me about at my age, I probably shouldn't be doing, you know, jujitsu and, and stuff like that. And, you know, he asked me what else I do and told him I like to lift weights. And, and, you know, he started talking about that too. You know, when you get a little bit older, you should lift lighter and, you know, your, our bodies, you know, aren't meant to do the stuff when we are younger. And, you know, I've talked to my dad about jujitsu. I've talked to people who don't necessarily train jujitsu and I, I hear the same thing all the time. You know, hey, at your age, maybe you shouldn't be training jujitsu. You know, I see you walking with a limp. Uh, you know, but hey, I'm not. You know, you didn't hear me complaining that my knee was hurting. You saw me walking with a limp. You you, you automatically assume, you know, that jujitsu is not good for me. And and you know, I've I've heard always about as you get older. You know, hey, we should stop lifting heavy. You know, it's going to hurt our knees. It's going to hurt our joints. Uh, this and that, just like jujitsu. And, you know, the, the one thing I like about my new doctor is, you know, as soon as I, I, and that's why I quit that doctor, you know, I was like that doctor, I, you know, that's ridiculous in my opinion. You know, my new doctor's like, Hey man, this is great. You know, I love it that you're still exercising. I love it that you're still in the gym lifting weights. I love it that you're doing this. You know, my, my old doctor wanted me to do uh, basically water aerobics, you know, non-stressful stuff. And that's how, that's against, how, I gotta interrupt. that's how old Gary is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, nothing against water aerobics. I'm not meaning to put that down, but you know, and and I was talking to my buddy here just this last weekend, who's a who's a fitness trainer, owns Ford Fitness, and Miles Brown. We've had him on the show here before, and we were talking about that. And uh, you know, a lot of times we baby our bodies too much. We we don't really know what it's capable of, and if I don't get out on the mat and you know there's people all the time i'll talk to and they'll be like hey you know I'm, I'm 45 years old it's probably too late for me to start training absolutely not it is not too late to start training you know i i want to you know lift weights i'm 50 years old you know it's probably too late i'm past my prime absolutely not get out there and train and i think sometimes we uh, doctors and you know people just throw their opinions out there they, they really aren't into the fitness lifestyle they don't you know, they haven't done research. They don't know a lot about about you. You know, they're not asking me questions about myself. They're just asking me what I'm doing and then telling me it's wrong. But I, I think sometimes we just we just listen to naysayers. We listen to people who say we can't train jujitsu. We listen to people who say I can't do this particular move in jujitsu. Um, you know, I can't invert. You know, I'm 51 years old. I don't like inverting, but I can invert. Whenever I put that notion in my head that I can't do it. It's never going to happen. Um, you know, if I listen to these so-called experts who tell me I shouldn't be doing stuff at this age that I did when I was 35 years old, you know, where would I be today? I'd probably be sitting around with a, a you know, Dunlap's disease and, you know, drinking beer and, you know, 40 pounds overweight. But I'm stronger today than I was at 30 years old. I'm better at jiu-jitsu today at 51 than I was at 45. I'm better at jiu-jitsu than I was at 35. It's, you know, our mind and our bodies can go a long way. It's, uh, you know, we need to test them. And, I mean, we need to test them smart. Like, I, I don't want to go um, and put a 1,000 pounds on my back and try to squat it. You know, that's just going to be a recipe for disaster. But we need to we need to push ourselves. We need to push our bodies to its, you know, we've got, we all have a breaking point, but do we really know where it's at? And, uh, if I just stay stagnant and don't push myself, I'm not going to get better. I'm not going to be a happy person. I'm not going to have a smile on my face. And, um, you know, I, I just was thinking about that just this last weekend and about my experience that I had numerous years ago. And if I would listen to that guy, I would not be on this podcast now because we're on episode 274, which is a little over five years of doing this. And I was probably 45 at the time, and I'm 51 now. So 
I would have never been in this podcast because I would have quit jujitsu and Byron would be laughing at me. And I would probably been on Byron's podcast. He would have been talking about the guy that he used to roll with that he started with and started this guy. He would be talking about the guy that started two weeks before, but before him. And he's like, yeah, the guy just quit because his doctor told him he shouldn't push himself. And now I saw him the other day and uh, he's 50 pounds overweight. He, you know, he can't really do much. And, you know, poor Gary, that's what would have been happening today. So, you know, don't necessarily listen to everybody. Do your own research, you know, push yourself to acceptable limits and, uh, you know, get out there and try stuff. Yeah, I, I think the real life lesson here is if your doctor's telling you something you don't want to hear, just find a new doctor because you know better than him, right, Gary? <laughs> <laughs> no, that, yeah. actually, yeah. there's so much truth to that, though, about <laughs> not letting people tell you what you can and can't do. And um, so I, for one, I'm glad you found a new doctor and I'm glad you're on the podcast with us, Gary. Yep. And he yep. got those rashes all cleared up as well. <laughs> no, but you. You do want to listen to your doctor within reason, too. I mean, your doc, doctors know stuff. But, you know, I, I do think a lot of times doctors are not, you know, some doctors aren't up to date on fitness and stuff of that sort. And, um, you know, and even, you know, talking to my personal trainer friend, he's like, man, a lot of these guys I got that are, you know, 50, 60 years old who've never lifted before, you know, I got them squatting 225 for sets of six. And uh, I was like, man, that's crazy. And, um, you know, just stuff that we didn't think was possible. So, uh, you know, don't necessarily discount stuff your doctor's saying. I don't want to say that. But, uh, you know, do some of your own research. Talk to other people. Get get different opinions. Um, and, uh, you know, make a wise decision. Yeah. Gary, here's what I think happens with most people's doctors. And we could do a whole episode on this. And we we got to get to interview it with Karen in a little bit here. But, uh Whenever I learn, and I've got several doctors in the family, or I, if I meet a doctor, I like to talk to them if I'm able to chat with them um, and, and see kind of what their perspective on things are. And more often than not, I hear, like, like my sister is a pediatrician. She will tell people, your child is overweight. He needs to exercise and eat better. And, and she'll go into details of how to do this. And they don't, they don't do the changes. They don't do that. And so what, what doctors see is that advice doesn't happen like it doesn't work telling somebody to, to exercise isn't a good thing to say because it doesn't change anybody's activities given a medicine giving them solutions with you know that are in the form of a bottle that's what doctors are used to and so when they get somebody like gary or somebody who you know you've gone your whole life and you don't like to work out you find jiu-jitsu it's a it's a lot of fun and it's exciting and you you like it your doctor's gonna look at you and say most people don't like to work out I don't like to work out. Work out is not this person's solution to the problem. It's going to be this this right here is your solution. This this medicine, this prescription, this this drug I can give you. And so I think that they're just they see it not being the correct solution for a lot of people, and they just assume it's the solution for everybody is is not fitness. But most doctors know that exercise is good for you. Most doctors know that if if you do it yeah you're going to get a little bit banged up here and there but the overall health benefits are are way better than than the cost and having talked to several it's just they, they can't prescribe fitness to anybody and they and have them follow that that order and people don't do it so i don't think i think your doctor in reality probably would would agree fitness is healthy yes um you know telling Gary not to do that is ridiculous. Telling you something that's boring is not a long term plan either. That's the great thing about jujitsu. It's fun. And I think like there's always that miscommunication between the doctor and the patient. I'm glad you found a good doctor who uh, sees what jujitsu is to you. And that might just be partially like how you communicated that to, to the doctor. But you sounds like you've got a great doctor. Um, maybe I'll be heading that way too, Gary, <laughs> to your doctor. Definitely, definitely. But speaking of fitness, I've got my popcorn popped. I'm going to fit this whole bag of popcorn in my mouth, and we're going to get on to the interview with Karen Antunes. He is the most interesting grappler in the world. In the 80s, he started every match with a flying armbar. One day, he was running late for an open mat, his car wouldn't start, and he was able to start it, too, with a flying armbar. With a gentle sweeping motion, he can rock any crying baby to sleep. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I prefer the BJJ Brick Podcast. Stay sweaty, my friends. 
All right, my friends, I'm happy to bring Karen Atunez to the BJJ Brick Podcast. Karen, I'm happy to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. This is my pleasure. Uh, I'm glad to have you. you you've got uh, a lot of things going on. You're a competitor. You have a, a long competition history. You, you're you also balancing uh, your off-the-mat life with on-the-mat life and all these things. But if we don't know you, if somebody's listening and they don't know who you are yet, Karen, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I moved to the United States in 2014. I was training with a Leo Vieira in California for a year and a half. And I, the same year I got a black belt. So it was a hard, was a tough year for me in 2014 because there was a new black belt jumping in a competition scenario. That was a tough year. And then I, lived, I moved to Minnesota for another year and a half. And all the time competing, winning some tournaments, losing some tournaments. Uh, I always was in the the most important tournaments, the awards, none. I won as a black belt a couple tournaments. Won uh, World Nogi, Tanam. And this year was the most uh, special one for me. After being a mother, I, uh, my daughter was born last year. So 2017, I was not competing the whole year pregnant and having a baby. So, and then I was able to win the Panam and the Word as a black belt. That was my biggest accomplishment. Yeah, that's, mother. That's, that's amazing. Thank you. It was a lot of hard work, but it worked. So, what was that like, uh, taking the year off and, and coming back uh, at that elite level? You know what? I didn't know I could. The only thing I knew by the time when I start training again, I want to be back. I want to compete because the competition life is part of me. You know, I don't do jiu-jitsu. I respect people who do just for hobby or something, but jiu-jitsu is a big part of my life. And competing before being a model was everything for me. And I couldn't choose motherhood or jiu-jitsu. I wish so, so. I start training and, but I, I didn't know I could win. You know, I just want to be back as good as I could. And it's, it's what I did. So I, I won. <laughs> do you think that you'll always compete? I hope so. Do, do you think if you're not, uh, able to compete, you, you won't have the same drive to train or do you think you'll still be wanting to train? I think the competition makes, makes me have like a goal. Yeah. You know? I don't think so. When I stop competing, I'm going to train as hard as I do right now. The discipline I had, I feel like I don't have a, a reason to do all this hard work. You know what I mean? Yeah, that that makes sense. If I stop competing, uh, do you feel I, I need to find something else? Or competing just as a master, or even do MMA, I don't know. Because... It, I love the, the challenge of doing something. I love the, the the thinking of always proving myself, not for the others, but myself. Why do you, Why do you think that that is that you like that challenge so much? Uh, I don't know. I really don't know. I just like the feeling when I'm not competing and when I'm not getting ready. I don't feel like I'm having a good time. I don't okay. feel like I'm having a vacation. You know, like. I like to compete. I like to do something. And I just find out I was 23 years old when I did my first competition, my first judicial competition. And I have a tough uh, childhood. I mean, my family was poor. I I have uh, six siblings. My parents couldn't, uh, couldn't support sport back in Brazil. So I just did it when I could pay myself. And I fell in love with it. So maybe going to be another different sport, but what you did so, so I, I find myself there when I was 23. I, I find the happiness for me. How did you just, how did you find Jiu Jitsu? So my, my, I was going to uh, tell my brother by number. My brother, number two, he, he was, he was a tough geek and he, the only thing when he was teenage, the only thing make him in the right, you know, right way, being good when he was turning to Jiu Jitsu. So 
so we find a, a black belt professor who's really nice with him, give the gift for him like for free, let him train for free, for free. Was and I was I loved his. I was I was young. I was I was the kid, and I was watching him how good the sport, how good jujitsu was for him. He loved. He really loved. And he passed out ten years ago. And that, when I started thinking about trying a uh, jujitsu, that that's why he loved it. That was the thing he loved. It. And my youngest sister, my sister number six, she decided to start it. She started training, and she was like asking me to do all the time. And one day I decided to try, it. and I tried it, and I love it. So my sister did it every time, ever. I uh, almost ten years and I never stopped training. She's still training too, but not as I do. She's a uh, purple belt. Wow, that's really good. So, that's uh, that's impressive that you both are sticking with it. That's that's really cool. Yeah. So you were kind of exposed to it by your brother, and you uh, later on kind of came back to it and and uh, and figured out that how great it was for you. Yeah, I had no idea this could be for me the same as work for him. Yeah. My life is crazy, so. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about balancing your life. Now, uh, I know being an athlete takes a lot of time and energy and focus. Uh, you're also a mother and, and a wife. Like, how, how do you how do you balance that? So I'm trying to, for sure, I train less. I train much less than okay. I used to train. But also, less training for me works better. You know, I feel like it works better. So before, it was like all day training, three things, training the day, two. Now I train one time in the morning, you do two. And I do some workout like two times a week, four times a week. And I spend time teaching and taking care of my my daughter. That's how I balance, like less training, but like harder, because I only have that time to train. So I don't waste my time. When I'm training, when I'm on the mat, I don't have time to play. Uh, I know some people like jokes on the mat, but I don't have time for that. So I'm there to train, like one hour, one hour and a half, done. So then I go home, eat some things, take care of my, my daughter and my husband is a big part of that. He helps a lot. You know, like the last year he was not even training hard so he could watch our baby and then I can train and then I can get ready. So I I he's a he's a biggest support ever. Because I have hard time leaving my daughter with someone else. Yeah. That's not me or him. So in the United States it's just us. It's just me and him. We need, we we help each other a lot. So talking about your training, if if you're training less, um, what did you stop doing training wise? Are you doing less, you know, weights or cardio or less technique and more rolling or more rolling and less technique? Like, what what did you do? What are you doing less of now? What I do, I do for sure less workout. Okay. For sure, always jiu-jitsu is my priority. If I have time for one train, that train going to be jiu-jitsu. And it's, um, it's intense. You know, jiu-jitsu is pretty intense. So we still have uh, the position and drills. But the train didn't change that much. It was, what changed was my time. So we're still doing a lot of drills. We like um, do a lot of training, you know, or role, but we still have time for technique and all those important stuff. It's just, working out is not my priority anymore, like, I, I used to, I like to go every day, not to help my disease to, to look good to. Today, I'm not even thinking about what I want to look good. I want to have a health body to help in disease. Because one need the other, for sure. Karen, can you describe your your game a little bit? Some of your favorite techniques and what you like to do on the mat? 
Uh, my game is always, uh, it's been always a tough game. You know, I trust my guard, but since I started, my, my husband, he was my, my professor, he was my coach, he always told me, you're, you're, you're the different thing from the other girls because you have a strong top game. All the girls do, do guard, you know? They feel more comfortable. Even I, I like to do guard, but when I go on top, I feel I got advantage. That's the, my, my baby, the top game. I love being top. I love the pressure. I love the speed. Like, I love being watching Leandro Mo. I got inspired by him. Like, not just me, for sure, a lot of people, but I love his techniques on top, for sure. Do you have a favorite guard pass? Not a favorite pass, like, not by name, not by name, but I do a lot of, like, opening guard. I don't like to be inside the guard. Yeah. So it's a lot. It's a lot of speed and switch grips. Karen, uh, do you do you work a lot of takedowns, or do most people uh, end up pulling guard on you and you can just go work top from there? No, I always go for a takedown. Always go for a takedown. I, I never did a judo. All the takedowns I know is a jujitsu takedown. Like it's not, it's not that fancy. It's not beautiful. But always looking for get my 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 opponent out of balance. We started from to start with two points. That's always a try. Always. It's not every time it's possible, but always try. Yeah. Do you typically train with with guys or ladies, or is it a pretty good mix? I like to train with group partners. Okay. Doesn't matter if they're doesn't matter if they're women, doesn't matter if they're men. Uh, I had a really good. Girls, I can't complain. I have really good guys that I can't complain. I'm pretty lucky with my team. So that's I, I like that answer. That's a that's a really uh, insightful answer. You like good partners. Tell me what makes a good partner besides somebody being really good at jujitsu. What makes a good partner? Well, I mean, a good partner. You know, that partner was not never complain about how they they are tired or how or if they are hurt. A good partner is they show up ready, ready for training. Because if I'm hurt, if I'm that tired, I'm not going to show up to train. Because then I'm going to mess up my partner training. You know what? The day I don't feel good, I would like not go training. I'd rather there than be a bad partner. For sure, we always have a, a hard day, a hard day when everyone's going to beat you up. But do not mean that you're feeling bad. It's just your bad day. It doesn't mean you are hurt or you are overtired. A good partner, even they don't have a good day, they're there to support. You know? About competition, it's harder because we have to be really, really selfish. We need, like, competitor, we are selfish because we got to learn ourselves. That's why I don't like to train when I'm teaching. It's different. Like, coaching mode. You know, like, I'm going to stop a little bit, talk with the students. I don't have any reason to smash my students. They go hard and don't let them do anything. I need to be in bad spots so then can, my students can try something. The competition training for me is totally different from the training I do at the gym, at my gym when I'm teaching. You know, I try to be a good partner, being like that. Be there for my, my friends, be there for my partners, because... You did so you can do by yourself, right? I can I can go sit down and do some drills by myself, but it's not the same. I need people, so I need to be a good for my partner. Make sense? Yeah, that does that does make a lot of sense, and and it's good that you're like you're one of the best of your training partners. You, you talk about uh, uh, you know training and teaching and, and keeping those a little bit separate. There, uh, when do you start? training for a tournament how long before the tournament starts do you stop teaching so much and start training more for yourself i uh, usually like we you know we always training so hard because it's a tournament after all the tournament after all the but when it's the uh, always like five weeks six weeks one month and a half before the competition 
we got like more to like more harm uh, yeah six weeks okay and do you but I mean not not, not always train but the last six weeks like last six weeks of work for Konan when we go really hard yeah You've done both gi and no gi. Do you prefer one over the other? Not that, that I prefer, but I just feel like no gi, it's harder. The training is harder. You're always really tired because, you know, it's it's more aggressive, for sure. Training with the gi, for me, it's more kind of natural. Uh, I don't get that tired. I don't get that hurt. My body doesn't feel all the power. But no gear is harder, but I like it. So <laughs> I'm glad we don't train as much as we do with the gear. Because I don't know if my body could handle. See, my style is really aggressive. I like to train. Uh, I don't like to waste my time, you know? So every time, every train, I feel so tired. And no gear, I feel double tired. Why do you think that is? Do you think it's your your style of play that makes you um, use up more energy in the no gi, or is it just you're used to playing in gi? Yeah, I think that's the style with the gi. With, you don't have the gi to stop your opponent. So, and usually I train with the guys that are stronger than me, so I need to use my speed to be in a better better position than them. Uh, with the gi, it's different. With the gi, I can hold the gi and wait to wear it and hold guard. You know, no gi, it's no way. You got to keep moving until you get a good spot. Yeah, th- there's definitely those differences, and and uh, I think everybody has different things about them that they like. Do you think that that training no gi helps your gi game a little bit? Sure, I'm pretty sure that the no gi for sure help us doing the, the gi. You know when you train or you compete with that partner, always use the gi with it small. You cannot do the grip, so you still able to train because you know the no gi grip. I think one helps really helps the other. Yeah. Uh, what do you do to if you're doing off the mat training? Let, let's just say you're not able to make it in or something like that. Do you do anything? Um, to help keep conditioning up or strength or flexibility? Mm, if I cannot train Jiu-Jitsu, like when I was pregnant, for example, I was doing all kind of training, speed, uh, crossfit, workout, something. You know, if you cannot work out, if you cannot, if you cannot squat, go swim, but do something. Never keep uh, be a victim on the side because you hurt your leg, you hurt your knee, and you can do anything. You still can do some things. You still can swim. You still can do upper body. You still can do abs. You know, I just don't believe that you can be just resting and being sad or sad because you're conditioning. Anything helps. What doesn't help is be sitting on the side on the couch and reading. Yeah, that's 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 great advice. What advice do you have for somebody who is going through a life change? Let's say they compete like you enjoy doing, and you know you had the experience of 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 having a baby and also wanting to compete. You just kind of took that year off, but like, what advice do you have for somebody who's going through maybe a job change, maybe having a baby, or like something happens big in their life? How do they keep training jujitsu? What do you have any advice for them? My advice. Is if you really want, you're gonna find a way to make it work. You know, uh, I know people they work all day, but they still find weekend. They wake up really early, or if they can't afford, they pay private because they want to keep work. Or um, about money, let's see, life changes, you lose your job, and you cannot afford it anymore. I'm pretty sure if you talk with uh, your your gym, your professor, they're going to give you any deal or let you train there or a month or two, you get a job or let you do any job at the gym. So you keep training, you can keep training at some open mat that you can do it. Uh, because I think, uh, someone asked me when I won uh, Panam for the first competition, big competition won after giving birth. 
And during the between matches, I had my first match, and my daughter she was really stressed because I think it was a lot of people screaming, and she was she was little, and I was breastfeeding her. So I went to the side and was breastfeeding her when I was resting for my next match. And someone asked me, how could you come back and just fight it? And I said, it, it's normal because that's what I want. And I do this every morning. I am training, but if she needs me, I stop training to take care of her. Uh, yeah, I don't even think about how hard it was. I know how hard it was, but I really wanted that. When you really want something, you find a way to do it. You know, make the, the bad things happen in your life. Make them one more reason to keep doing what you like, what you want. You won't be going to give up if that's not what you like it, what you dream with. It sounds like you're very uh, goal-oriented. You said that goal, then it's hard to keep you from it. How have you seen the female divisions uh, change over the years? I think a lot. I see so many girls, so many black belts. And I don't I don't know I don't know why. Maybe because of the gyms now they have they are more open for girls or women. Like I see a lot of male professor coaches, they support the girls, the little girls, the old women. You know, they really like having the woman at the gym. And I think that's why more women keep training, keep coming because they feel comfortable. They don't feel that that mass, that space, that gym is just for the men. The women feel good at the gym, how it's supposed to be. It, it's great to see it see it grow and I think that yeah the coaches are are, are a big part of that. For sure. Because they have the power. They have the power to make us feel good or make us feel really bad and uncomfortable. Uh, what do you do as a coach that you think is different than most coaches? What I do? Uh, you know, the role of the years, I learned a little bit of training and coaching. Everyone is different. I can't, I can't teach everyone the same. So my oldest student right now, she's 61 years old. You know, I can't teach her the same as I teach a teenager boy. It's a totally different environment. Uh, I try to make her comfortable with everything her her body is able to do and progress, low progress. I think that's the big, biggest uh, accomplishment for me as a coach. Learning people are different. Learning how to help with different people and encourage them, push them in a good way. You know, and I still learning. A lot. I'm gonna do my mistakes for sure, but when I see like uh, the students like her, her name is Kay Catherine, like she keeps trying, she keeps evolving, her body keeps moving more mobility, I feel proud of myself. The same when I watch a kid that I teach, how the kids improve, or when uh, some kids are really shy, they tired, they don't know how to even touch each other. In the end of the month, they are laughing, rolling, hugging each other. That makes me feel good, and I'm doing something right. Karen, do you remember your first tournament and what that was like? Yeah, I do, because it was not a long time ago. Remember? <laughs> <laughs> what uh, was that? What happened? What I, was it like? I did my first tournament. I was training for only three weeks. I was yeah, it was the end of April. I remember it was in Brazil my hometown, and uh, was a, she was a yellow belt, a dog yellow belt, I don't get it, but anyway, um, I did her a double leg, and I just held her on the mat for the three minutes, but it was one of the happiest days of my life, crazy, because only three weeks of this, I had no idea what I was doing. But as my professor, Michael, today my husband, he just told me, take down and hold her. It's what I did. I did her. I put her down and I held for the whole time. I won. But that day, I knew I loved that. I knew I couldn't stop. And I was competing almost every weekend. Like every two weeks, I was competing crazy. 
And I think that's why I I evolved a lot. I got that progress because I was competing. And competition brings something you don't learn at the gym. You see your mistake, you can fix something. When you just train at the gym, it's hard to see what you do wrong, what can get better. And I'm I always I was hungry for learning to get better. Competition was a big part of that. Learn fast. I got a black belt in five years. Uh, crazy, but that's amazing. Thank you. So you got some good advice early on during that uh, first tournament, uh, you know, about getting a takedown and, and, and controlling and holding. Um, does that affect the way you coach new people? When, do you think about that at all, like trying to give them, like, simple advice that you know that they could do? Sure. Uh, I still do that. Like, I like basic stuff. You know, I like always uh, for beginners, we teach a lot of cold guard. When I teach beginners, for example, I teach some techniques from cold guard. But when I teach the higher belt, I still teach in some cold guard. I like the basic jiu-jitsu. Like, my jiu-jitsu is not that fancy. When I teach, when I roll, is different because I like to be loose. I like to keep jumping, switching sides. But I just like the basic. And the same, the same uh, device I do before competition, I tell my students, go straight, focus, and do the basic. Like, hold your grace. Yeah. He's, he's a great example of that. Yeah. So, how many times a week do you train? Jiu-Jitsu? Yeah. Six times a week. So, do you have, like, a set schedule? Like, it's every it's these six days and not this one? Uh, yes. Uh, because I train Monday to Saturday. And okay. And I rest Sunday. Sunday is rest day. What what advice do you have? Because some, you know, there's a lot of people out there that train that they can't train six days a week. Um, what advice do you have for somebody who has like a more limiting schedule? Maybe they only train two or three times a week. Um, you still can train two, three times a week, but if you compare uh, the speed of learning, more you train, more you learn. It's no secret. Less you train, less you're gonna be tra- less you're gonna be learning, less you're gonna be catching up. It doesn't mean that's not work. Training is always a war. Even if you can train just one time a week, but you can't compare yourself with someone who's training every day. That's the difference. Because we don't teach the same thing every day at the gym. You don't train with the same partners every day at the gym. So you got a lot of different parts, you got a lot of different positions. You got a lot of advice from your partner that you're going to have just two times a week. You know what I mean? Yeah. So more you train, more you train, more you learn. No secret. But it's also some people have to find that balance to where they, they can't train so much, but they still love it and, and, and they get better at a little different rate. Yeah, but two or three times a week for the people cannot train every day I know work family it's hard three times is good three yeah three times you're still able to learn a lot three times you're still able to learn a lot yeah yep it's, it's better than not going at all <laughs> <laughs> you know what helps too doing private class once in a while you know like once, once a month do private with someone some coach not not necessarily your own, you know. Uh, private that fix so one hour private private class he fix so much in our game. I do do private when I had opportunity to do private. I do because we all get to learn something, and and that what I feel like the private class helps a lot. So how how do you advise somebody to take a private? Do you, do you like the, the teacher to, to show certain things? Would you like the student to have questions and the teacher helps out? I like to the private because when we roll, the other person, my coach, for example, or another black belt, they can show what I'm doing wrong. They can see 
Because when you're tired, when you're rolling, you can't do your own thing. You know, you need someone watching you from outside or rolling. That's how I do private. When I teach private, I roll with the person first. And after I roll, I start, let's talk on this, let's fix this or, or that. Or I, I ask first what kind of what kind of game you want to play, what kind of game you want to learn. And then I roll with them and see if they're ready to learn that. Because some people show up, let out. Oh, I l- want to learn a fly armbar. Wait, first you got to learn how <laughs> to do a guard. Yeah. Right? So first you need to know an uh, armbar, even from the, on the ground or from the floor. It's not, it's so many things you need to learn first to have a babe to start learning the strength and the hardest movement. People watch it. Um, Kenato Kanut. Do you know him? Who was his name? Renato Kanutu. With R. Renato yes, Kanutu. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> he's doing all these crazy movements, but he's been doing that his whole life. You know, like, and now the, the keys, the what else, they watch him and he go crazy. It, it's so, so good to watch him doing that, but it's not for everyone. Yes. So you need to, especially when you're new, focus on the, the more basic things. And as you uh, get that skill built, you're able to kind of expand and, and do things more like Hanato's doing? Yeah. Sure. Uh, your example there with the uh, flying R bar is really nice because uh, a lot of people like that would be really neat to do. But if you don't have, first you first have to have a decent guard. And then you have to have a pretty good arm bar or a really good arm bar, and then you could maybe explore that a little bit more. Um, and, and that's, yeah, I think that makes sense to people who just want to say, I want to learn the flying arm bar. Well, you should probably learn how to do a regular arm bar first. <laughs> and since you're going to put yourself yeah. on your back on purpose, you should have a pretty good guard anyway. And so you got to build yeah. those blocks before you could get to that the, the result that you want. Exactly. All right. No jumping fast. <laughs> Do uh, do you have any part of your game that is um, kind of fancy that you like to, to do, or do you like to keep it pretty simple? Um, uh, I do a lot when I train. I do a lot of armbar from crazy position. You know, I still train the base. I always start from basic, but then when scramble. I like to do crazy stuff. I'm not necessarily unbar from guards or, um, you know what? Like, I see the arm and I just go for it. It's hard to, it's hard to teach, but, <laughs> uh, works when we fight when it's far. Yeah. Because it... I think I, because I think I have a good basic movement. Yeah, I think you know, my arm bar is not anywhere near as as good as yours. But um, when I start to do arm bars a lot, I see them more often. They're easier to find. Oh, yeah, I could do the arm bar here. If I get away from doing arm bars very often, I, I don't really see them anywhere until you get the perfect opportunity. So I think you know you you have a, a really good fundamental arm bar, and then you could see it from so many other places. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. That's my my own experience. So that's I mean that's just if you want to develop a game like that, the listeners want to um, just keep focusing on on the the original arm bar and do more and more and more of those, and I think that that helps you uh, develop different parts of that. Yeah, I agree. Like for example, how we train, we do we do a lot of drills. I know a lot of people doesn't like to drill, but us work because you repeat the same position a lot of times and and, and with the speed you know without a resistance for sure of my partner but for me helps because I do so many times that on uh for example the Toriano on bar Toriano on bar Toriano on bar when you grow when it's far your body just go you don't think about it you don't lose time thinking about it yeah that, that... And, uh, when yeah, when you train with and when you train with the high level people like competing with those high level the level was so close 
the little little second is gonna make all the difference. The little mistake makes you lose or win. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a good example of of why drilling is so important especially at the high level. I guess any level, but uh, it's a good example of why everybody knows those arm bars, but if you drill them and drill them, you don't have to think. You just your body just does it. Mm-hmm. And you're a step ahead of everybody. Yeah. Karen, uh before I let you go, do you have any uh sponsors you'd like to mention? Sure. Um uh, I'm sponsored by Hyperfly, the do or die company that you can teach hard. That's a lovely part. And if, if somebody wants to uh, train with you or send you a message online, what would be a good way to do that? Yeah, you can send me a message by Facebook or Instagram or email. I'm going to be more than happy to have people here. Good. Is there a, a website for the gym or a Facebook page for the gym? Yeah, we have uh, all the social media, Facebook and Instagram, Prodigy, DJJ. And the website is prodigybjj.com. We have all the information there. Karen, that's great. I'll put links to that so people could find it if they want. If they're able to train with you, that'd be that'd be great. Uh, sounds like a great training environment. Yeah, we try to have a good environment, like a big family, a training hard, or a little easier. Some days we yeah. have all the kind of classes, you know. Little gee, kids, problem, women's only, beginners. So, yeah, if you want to try out, it's top five. That's awesome. Karen, thank you so much. Do you have any final uh, words or thoughts for the audience? Sure. At first, I want to I wanna thank for the opportunity for being talking a little bit about myself, about gym, about career, about life. I appreciate it. And looking forward to do many, many other times whenever you want to. Thank you again. Yes, thank you so much. I, I, I learned a lot from you. It's been great getting to know you. My pleasure. As we get the interview wrapped up, thank you, Karen, for the uh, interview. Gary's just now finishing his popcorn that he just crammed into his mouth. Wow, that was a lot of popcorn you ate, Gary. I'm impressed. Yep, I'm going to have a little bit of trouble sleeping tonight, I think. So what I need to do is go back and listen to episode 273 and uh, definitely uh, figure out how to sleep. That'll put you to sleep. Definitely put me to sleep. Or just listen to you talk will put me to sleep. (laughs) Checkmate, I guess. I'll take that one. Well played. Yeah, thank you, Karen, for the interview. Uh, Really enjoyed learning from you in all seriousness. It's it's great to have you on the show. And... uh, it's a great opportunity to see somebody in your position accomplishing uh, the goals you are and your inspiration to us all. So uh, thanks for hopping on the show with us, Karen. And we look forward to follow guys, follow Karen on social media. Uh, she's a lot of fun and you could kind of keep up with her. She uh, trains and competes. There's no better way, man, what a world we live in. You get to get to know what's like behind the scenes stuff online and, and follow people as they go compete. What a time. I remember like you not know anything about, the people that would go compete and then you read it online or even in the, like a magazine and like after it way after it happened, like who is this person? Why did they do well? And now you get to see all the behind the scenes stuff. Well, you know, what's crazy Byron is you said follow her on uh, social media. I just looked her up on uh, Facebook and just friend request sent. So I listen to you well, Byron. I t- I actually told her in advance, do not accept Gary. <laughs> He's kind of creepy. <laughs> this is a very special well, episode. Well, I'm used to I'm used to rejection, so uh, I'll <laughs> probably get that. Very special episode here, guys, for two reasons. Uh, we saved the quote for the last part of the show, which we'll bring in now, and then after the quote, we have an article written by a guy named Gary. So, Joe, what's up with the quote? Yeah, this week's quote is brought to you by. Mario Andretti, a uh, pretty good race car driver, I think, uh, knows a little bit about success, a little bit about achieving excellence. And his quote is, desire is the key to motivation, but it's determination and commitment to an unrelenting pursuit of your goal, a commitment to excellence that will enable you to attain the success you seek. And when I read that, it really uh, resonated with me. Um, 
because yeah a lot of people have a desire to be good at something how many people have picked up a guitar and played for six months or where they start a martial arts and they train for a year or two they've got the desire and that's enough to motivate them to get started but in order to be really really successful you have to have a commitment to excellence um, an unrelenting uh, pursuit of your goals and when I say commitment to excellence that's really doing your best because a week of training that's excellent for me is not going to look anything like a 25 year old purple belt who's on his way to worlds or something but it's important for me to be doing my best every week and for me to be pursuing my goals every day that's the only way that I'm going to uh, how does he put it that's the only thing that will enable me to attain the success that I seek so thank you Mario and Dreddy for that quote yeah, good quote, Joe. And I gotta say, if you're uh, if you went by and liked our Facebook page, you might have seen that one a little bit in advance because Joe Facebooked it out there to everybody. <laughs> I was gonna say <laughs> tweeted, but that didn't work. It it uh, he Facebooked it out to everybody, posted it, and uh, it was well received by by much of the listening audience. So that's cool, Joe. And so that brings us to the article for this week. You can find that on the BJJ Brick uh, webpage. It's by none other than Gary Hall. Gary, tell us a little bit about this article. Well, uh, Byron called me up and said, <laughs> hey, Gary, uh, we don't have a lot of money this week to uh, to buy an article, so we need you to write an article. And I was like, Byron, you know I failed uh, school numerous times, but – I will take one for the team, and I will get this done um, for the podcast. Um, but, you know, this, this is one that I really like, and it, it's all about growing jujitsu. And, you know, that's our goal of this podcast. That's what I'm trying to do is get more people into jujitsu. And, you know, basically I call it Welcome to Jiu-Jitsu, or Byron calls it Welcome yeah, to Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah, Gary, didn't, you didn't put a title on your, on your article, so I just had to make one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would have had a much better title. That's true. Uh, yeah, yeah, title would have been better. But, you know, so, you know, I was just thinking about, you know, your first time to go to Jiu-Jitsu. Did you feel welcome or, or did you feel awkward? And, and you know, we want to close the deal. We want that person to uh, train Jiu-Jitsu. And, you know, I thought back of a story, and I, I thought of this numerous times. Um, you know, the, the job I have now, I remember uh, going, you know, I got an interview for that job. I was at a job I didn't really like and uh, trying to find another job. And, you know, I had an interview, so, you know, I did a whole bunch of research on the company. I was as, you know, prepared, you know, just like going into a jiu-jitsu tournament. You know, I did my homework, you know brush my teeth, uh, slip with my nose strips on, comb my hair, put some gel in it, you know, looking sharp, shoes shined, all ready for the interview. And, you know, did my homework. I was going to ace this interview and get the job. I walk into the building and, you know, I had done my homework. I knew exactly where it was. I knew how long it was going to take me to get there at a certain time. And, you know, I wanted to make sure I arrived, you know, 10, 15 minutes early, uh, get there nice and early. So I do all that, uh, you know, feeling great, hop out of the car, and I go into the building. And it's not your traditional building where right off the bat you go in and you see a receptionist station, you know, where I'm going to go in and, uh, you know, say, hey, I'm Gary, I'm here for an interview. I go into this building and, you know, it's a huge area. And there's so many people around there. There's offices off to the side and, and people and and my as I was scanning I couldn't find a receptionist spot and I couldn't really find anybody who just looked like they were looking for people to come in you know a smiling face I didn't see that smiling face right off the bat and so you know I came in and all of a sudden I, I was like a deer in headlights you know I was just kind of stood still I was just kind of stopped and it's like okay oh uh. then all of a sudden my confidence starts wavering and I was like okay what do I do now it's like you know I've got a problem and I got to think my way out of this problem and you know so I'm feeling very awkward and it felt like forever but like I say in the the article it's probably only five seconds but then a lady came up to me and uh you know she greeted me with a big old smile and she's like hey are you gary you know i said and i was like yeah she knew my name already and uh she's like oh yeah they're expecting you they're up in the boardroom let me uh get you the elevator and everything and as she's taking me to the elevator she's you know the whole time she's talking to me and it, as she puts me in the elevator and she's about ready to hit the button to go up she sees some lint on my coat 
basically takes that off. I just remember she just made my day, you know, that, that smiling face. And, uh, you know, I went up, I aced that interview. And, you know, I, 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 I always say I aced that interview because of that service I received from her. And, um, you know, so that reminds me of jujitsu. You know, I see a lot of times uh, um, people come into a jujitsu school and let's say it's in the middle of a, a class, the middle of a practice. The instructor really doesn't have time. Um, and, you know, that person may may come in there and, and sit around for a little while and watch and then, and then walk out. And, you know, it, then, you know, I, I've heard, heard people say, you know, hey, you know, the instructor should have went over and talked to that person. And, and, you know, so be it. You know, we're trying to trying to grow this school. You know, what's the proper protocol? And. I look at it that is it really just the instructor's job to welcome new people? And, you know, I see Byron do this all the time. And I can't really talk for Joe because I've only met Joe in person a lot but or a couple times. But I know Joe is a very outgoing person, so I could see him doing it. But I think it's, you know, us as a whole community, as a school, as a team that we should all take. You know, it's all of our jobs to welcome this person to our school, to our team. We need to make this person feel comfortable. We need to grow it. And so if I see my instructor or the owner is busy or in the back and somebody comes in, man, I'm, I'm going to go right up to that person. You know, I'm going to put my hand out to, you know, I'm going to smile to that person. I'm going to extend a handshake, offer a smile and say, welcome to the gym. My name's Gary. What's yours? And, you know, I, I want to close the deal thinking of this in a, in a business term. You know, I, I want to close that. I, I want this person to become a member of our team. You know, the, the benefits are we're going to grow our school. We're going to have more people in our gym, um, which is going to lead, uh, you know, and as I was talking to Joe about this, it's, it's going to lead to more classes, more opportunities. We, we could be at a smaller school that might only have classes on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. If we grow this school, you know, pretty soon, maybe we got classes five days a week plus Saturday morning might have an open mat. We keep growing it bigger. Next thing you know, we got a, a noon class, a lunch class. You know, sometimes I might want to make the lunch class and, and, uh, you know, miss, miss a night class and hang out with my family. Um, you know, we grow it even more. Next thing you know, we have a, have a morning class before work. It's just gives me more opportunities to learn more people to meet more people to make me better, more people to help me achieve my goal to get from step one to step two to step three. And, um, you know, I just think that if we all just think about it, in terms of let's all grow the school. Let's all welcome that new person in. You know, we've talked so many times about the first time we go to a school. That's the hard part. The hard part is walking in that door the very first time. And if we're all there with a smile and we're all greeting everybody, shaking hands, you know, answering questions, helping them out, we're going to we're going to close more deals. We're going to have a bigger school. We're going to have more opportunities. We're going to grow grow jujitsu. Man, that was awesome, Gary. Let me tell you why the the little bit about her pulling that lint off your sports coat is my favorite part of this whole article. <laughs> when we talk about when we talk about welcoming the new student into jujitsu, or if you read articles about it, or you listen to other podcasts, there's always sort of a, a general list that comes up, and it, it's similar for everybody. You know, make sure you introduce yourself. Make sure you get to know their name. Uh, make sure they understand how the class is structured. If they've never been to class before, help them with the warm ups. Uh, if they got a brand new gi, they've never worn one. Uh, they don't know how to tie their belt. Help them out with that. You know, there's sort of a, a list of things that we want to make sure that uh, we help them out with. And I'm sure in the white collar corporate world, welcoming people into your business, welcoming prospective new employees. I'm sure there's also a list, you know, give them a good handshake, greet them with a smile, again, know their name, all these things. Nowhere on that list, nowhere on anybody's list is help them groom. You know? yep. yeah, nowhere awesome. on the list is, is yep. uh, take a piece of lint off their sports coat. And, and I think that's sort of next level uh, in this. It, it's good to have those lists. It's good to have a starting place. But what we really want to do, at least what I want to do, is I just want to be interested enough in the people that come in the gym, and I just want to be a decent enough person that maybe I'll see something that's not on the list, and I'll be able to help them out. And and those things, I think, when it 
comes to making an impression on somebody, comes to closing the deal, like you say, those things go a lot further than just checking off the list. You know, that's a great point, Joe. When you were talking about that, and as I realized you weren't going to make fun of me like you normally do, <laughs> which is where I thought you were going first. I figured you were going to make some bad grooming habits of me. Gary, but I got your back, make, man. I'll get you. Yeah, yeah, literally. Yeah. But it made me think about, I, I was going to go with, you know, the, the belt tying thing. You know, how many times do you see somebody going to the gym? They have no clue how to tie the belt. I remember I was terrified about tying my belt. No, you know, I bought a gi and no, it doesn't come with instructions on how to tie the belt. And this was a long time ago, really. I mean, internet was around, but it was dial up internet and there probably wasn't it as much on the internet as there is today. But I just remember, I was like, man, I'm going to look like a fool tying this belt. And I remember, you know, my instructor saw how bad my belt was, but he gave, you know, he, that was one thing he noticed, you know, it was terrible right off the bat, but he took the time and explained it and showed me how to do it. But, uh, that's kind of what I thought you were going to go with there. You know, it's just something that, you know, everybody always, you know, has issues with. And, um, but, uh, yeah, she, she went over, over the top by doing that. And, you know, I'm so grateful to her to this day and she no longer works with me. She retired, but, um, you know, she's somebody I've always looked up to and, and, you know, I hope that I can affect somebody the way she affected me. And she didn't just affect me just by helping me out that day. She, you know, just working with her, you know, daily for five years made a, you know, I, I just realized the type of person she is. And, and I think if I can be that type of person to people walking into a jujitsu gym or, you know, telling people my why of jujitsu, I think that, you know, we will grow this, grow jujitsu. We will grow schools. We will grow our local community in jujitsu, which, um, you know, we just, I want everybody to train jujitsu that wants to. I just want everybody to have the opportunity and uh, hopefully it will be for them. Listening to you guys talk here, uh, I'm so proud of this show. You guys are doing like so good. Gary wrote this article it's well thought out. It's it's a great example of, of how like little things make a big difference. And Joe picks out a, a detail in it that I kind of overlooked and explained it and, and how important that is. And like, man, you guys are awesome. But typically <laughs> what's missing is what Gary actually thought was going to happen. Somebody kind of teasing him a little bit about the article. <laughs> Gary, I got your back, man. <laughs> no worries. Uh, so she actually, uh, you know, is no longer with the company. Gary was, able, was finally able to push her out in a power struggle <laughs> and take her position. You he now keeps a, fu- a lint roller yeah. in the desk. But actually, yeah. guys, it wasn't even lint roll. Like he downplayed that significance of the story significant. Like it a was lot. somebody's hair because I got in a fight in the parking lot and I put somebody in a headlock. No, actually, Gary, she had an extra pair of sweatpants kept underneath the desk there for when, you know, <laughs> one of those kids need to need, okay, you need new pants, man. <laughs> Something happened oh. just now and you need new pants. So Gary, Gary went into interview wearing a suit and tie and waist down with sweatpants and he's able to pull that off. And that was amazing. Well, you want to know the crazy thing about her is <laughs> probably not. Our, uh, you remember our old training partner, Mark? Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, Mark, was an electrician and would come into our building and uh, do some electrical work. So he got to know her because to come into the building to get your badge to show that you're a visitor, you have to go through her. And, uh, you know, she, like I said, she's so talkative. She'll talk to anybody. So she ends up talking to Mark all the time. And Mark finally, you know, starts working up in my area, you know, comes up to the third floor and starts doing some stuff and uh, sees me up there. He goes down and starts talking to her and tells her about how I do jiu-jitsu and all this and that, which, you know, nobody in the whole building knew I knew jiu-jitsu. So she tells everybody in the whole building I do jiu-jitsu. So every time there's any kind of commotion in the parking lot and, or, you know, this is kind of close to downtown, so, you know, some crazy stuff go on, I always get called to uh, kick somebody out, to you know, handle the commotion in the parking lot. And it was like all because of that one day that guy came in <laughs> and they found out I did jujitsu. 
Yeah, I wasn't there's, happy there's about three, that part. There's three large bikers in the lobby causing problems. <laughs> Go get Gary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, thanks. Yeah, so one there person are... goes against Gary, another person yeah. goes against the sweatpants for when he wets himself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> three guys with guns in the lobby. Let's call Gary. You know, and what I would do is I would just use my newfound confidence. I'd look him in the eye, and then I would pull guard. They would laugh so hard that I, I could get them out of the gym at that point or out of the workplace. And into the gym. Yes. <laughs> Gary, great article, man. Uh, I, I look forward to writing more. And, and the, the, the style of writing is already better than my style of writing. <laughs> I've written, I don't know how many articles, but this is, uh, Gary, you started off real strong, my friend. I will tell you that's the first article I have written. Byron and Joe have probably wrote and written 400 articles, and uh, they uh, made me do this one. So maybe I'll do some others. I, yeah, uh, so so make ch- make sure and check us out for episode 550 <laughs> when, when Gary will have his next article. <laughs> I don't know. I'll, it'll be that quick, though, Joe. I- <laughs> <laughs> oh, good one. Guys, uh, I want to thank our Patreon supporters. Our newest Patreon supporters are Richard, Stephen, Thomas, and Jamie. Thanks, guys, for hopping on Patreon and supporting the podcast. If you are interested in supporting the show and helping us grow and do this in a bigger, better way, check out the link in the show notes for Patreon. Uh, basically, what you'll do is most people, and, and you could do differently, most people will donate a dollar per episode to the show. They, they listen and say, hey, that was worth a dollar. I learned a dollar worth of stuff or had a dollar's worth of enjoyment or motivation from the from the podcast this week, and you want to kick in a buck. We are honored to get that. Uh, what we do is we send you out a BJJ Brick Gi patch. It's five inches across. You can patch that thing anywhere that can... Uh, could accept a patch, uh, jackets, shirts, pants, leather pants. What would you say, Gary? Foreheads. Foreheads. Foreheads, Foreheads is, is, is painful. Um, and uh, Or even keys. Uh, we also send you out a uh, BJJ Brick sticker. And if you want to join the private Facebook group, send me an email at bjjbrick at gmail.com with your Facebook information. And I'll get you added in to the private Facebook group. Very secret. Top secret. Even, but you, Gary has has snuck his way into the group. <laughs> well, I I have admin privileges, so I added Ooh. myself. That's very nice. But uh, happy to have uh, the new members here, and the, of course the old supporting members. Uh, tremendous uh, thank you to you guys as well. Yeah, I can't tell you guys how much we appreciate you. Uh, hey, guys, check us out on social media. We're on Facebook. Uh, YouTube, of course, we have a BJJ Brick app, easiest way to get the episode every week. Um, so yeah, stop by and uh, stop by one of the social media outlets and say hi. Yep. Next week, my friends, we have Gina Franson uh, on the podcast again. We had her uh, a couple of years ago, and she actually came in through Wichita and taught a seminar for the We Defy Foundation. I was like, man, I gotta get uh, Gina back on the show. She she did an amazing job in the seminar. She did a great job during the interview uh, years ago, but you know how things go. I, you know, forget about things, and I, I, sh- I should, I should keep a list of people who need to come back, and and she'd be on the list, but I don't have that list. <laughs> so getting to meet her and, and talk with her, I was like, man, let's do another interview. Let's get you back on. So next week will be uh, Gina Franson, and uh, excited to bring you guys that interview. And maybe we'll have a new article by Carrie. <laughs> well, it's not episode 587 yet, Barn. <laughs> All right. Well, stay sweaty, my friends. And don't forget to shower. Train hard, train smart, get better. We'll see you on the mats, guys. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Welcome back to the BJJ Brick Podcast. This week is episode 274. <laughs> That's Start right, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Gary, why don't we have a blooper reel this time of you doing the intro? <laughs> <laughs> well, I just gave you a good one. Telling him, hey, you know, I've got, you know, my knees banged up and this and that, my, and... Oh, I'm sorry.
Let's start this over again, Barn. Okay, Gary. This will be great with your blooper reel. <laughs> well, that was a bit long to cut into a reel. 